When using grass filed assets and gscatter, do you find your computer slowing down? Has Blender become sluggish? Or has it frozen up altogether? Usually, the main reason is we've just got too much going on in the viewport. Numerous assets and or multiple scatter systems in our scene will tax your computer resources. But how do we keep creating beautiful imagery and not get bogged down? Well, buy a better computer. Thanks for coming. This was gscatter tips and tricks. Only kidding, obviously. And even if you are lucky enough to be working with the latest and greatest tech, you'll probably still manage to reach its limits. With that in mind, here are some real tips and tricks that you can use right now. OK, let's start with the gscatter outliner. While the options in this panel might seem obvious, you'd be amazed at how often they're overlooked. These three icons can really help save some hair pulling. The first one, this circle, turns proxies on and off. Proxies are an approximation of the assets in your scene, providing a good idea how they're distributed without the performance overhead. Because proxies are low resolution, it makes sense that when they're turned on, things can really speed up again. Whee! Next to the proxies icon is the eye icon, which turns the respective scatter system off and on in the viewport. This can not only help keep your computer working smoothly, but it's also great for isolating a scatter system to work on it separately. Bear in mind that even if the eye icon is turned off for a particular scatter system, it will still show up in a render. To affect a render, well, you've guessed it. You can turn the camera icon off and on here. Again, this is great for either isolating a single scatter system at render time or for eliminating it from a render altogether. Ah, choice. It's a wonderful thing. Moving on to the Effect Layers panel, we have the Distribute on Faces effect. This is included by default when you add a new scatter system to your scene. A useful option inside this effect is the Viewport Display Slider. At 100%, we see all of the assets for the selected scatter system in the viewport. If I move this to 50%, we're now only seeing half of those assets in the viewport. Set this to a level that works best for you and your computer's resources. And like the eye icon in the outliner, this setting is a viewport only option. Regardless of what level it's set to, 100% of assets will appear in your render. Below the effect layers panel is the optimization panel, which contains a camera culling option. To get this option working, switch it on by checking this box and then select the camera you want to use in this dropdown. When activated, all assets that fall outside of the camera view have their visibility turned off. This option works for both viewport and rendering. The potential downside is that assets outside of the camera view might be having an indirect effect. For example, if you cull shadow casting assets, those shadows won't be present in the render either. However, we can adjust things to help. More on this in a minute. The first two settings, focal length and sensor size, work in conjunction with the Blender camera focal length and sensor size. Essentially, the camera culling options simulate the Blender ones, changing the culling area without changing the camera itself. For example, the camera culling focal length is set to 50 millimeters, but if I change this to 35 millimeters, you can see the shape of the culled area changes to simulate what the Blender camera would see if it was also set to 35 millimeters. Looking through the camera, you can see that the culled area is larger than the camera frame. This is due to the mismatch in settings, 35 millimeters for the camera culling focal length, as we've just set it, and 50 millimeters for the Blender camera. However, if I also set the Blender camera to 35 millimeters, you can see that the culled area then matches the camera frame. Sensor size in the camera culling panel works in a similar way, allowing us to match whatever sensor size is set for the Blender camera. If my Blender camera sensor size is, say, 30 millimeters, I can just change the camera culling sensor size too. Using these two settings in this way means we will always be able to maintain the most efficient culling area, fitting it to the borders of the camera frame. The render width and render height settings here are a representation of the Blender camera render resolution. To demonstrate, we have our camera render size set to 1920 by 1080 pixels, which is matched here as an aspect ratio of 16 to 9. You can see that the culled area fits neatly inside the camera view. 
If I change the camera resolution to be square, say to 1080 by 1080 pixels, you can see that while the camera view has changed, the culled area has stayed the same, which means that it now doesn't fit properly inside the camera frame. To fix this, all we need to do is input a square ratio in the render width and render height fields. So I could add one to one, and there you go. The culled area now matches the Blender camera resolution. By the way, if you don't want to work with ratios, and I don't, you can simply use the same numbers in the render width and render height fields as the Blender camera resolution. Handy. Okay, moving on. The buffer setting. This option allows us to increase or decrease the culling area. There are two main reasons why this is useful. The first is that you might want to include more assets beyond the camera frame boundary, just a little, to ensure that the hard edges of a culled area are not perceptible. And the second is to retain assets that might be having an indirect effect, such as shadow casting, as mentioned earlier, on the objects inside the culling area. I'll use this cube scatter system to demonstrate. With no buffer, the assets are matched exactly to the camera frame, which is great. But obviously, I then can't see the shadows being cast by objects outside of it. Increasing the culling area allows us to make more assets appear, even though they're not visible to the camera, which means I now get shadows falling into the frame. Obviously, the buffer setting is a trade-off between computer resources and final render requirements but feel free to play with it until you find a good balance that works for your use cases. Next on the list is the backface culling option. This is presented as a checkbox to switch the setting on and off and a threshold slider. When you have a scene that includes areas that face away from the camera, for example, a hilly terrain, as you can see on my simple mock-up here, the culling area essentially projects through the emitter surface. So, those assets are still visible, even though from the camera view, they don't really need to be. If I switch back face culling on, well, nothing changes. At least, not until I adjust the back face threshold. If I change this down from one, depending on your scene setup, the assets on the back face of the emitter, that is, any areas facing away from the camera, are then made invisible. If you have lots of assets in your scene, this will really help to keep your viewport performing smoothly. And last, but certainly not least for the G-Scatter optimization panel is distance culling. If I switch the option on with this checkbox and play with the slider, depending on your scene, there will be a point at which the culling area will start to shrink in from the far side. This is great for removing any unnecessary assets. For example, I might have a wall that the camera can't see beyond. However, the assets are still present here on the other side. Because my emitter is flat, I can't use backface culling, but if I use distance culling, I can easily pull in the culling area to where the wall is and remove any assets that the camera can't see. Superb. Okay, you now have a good understanding of the different optimization options within GScatter. We've covered scatter system proxies and visibility for viewport and rendering. We've seen how to use the viewport display setting inside of the effect layers panel to reduce the number of assets visible in the viewport. And we've also covered the available settings in the optimization panel. One, some or all of these options should be a big help in maintaining viewport and render performance for your scenes. Before I finish up, I'd like to say that here at Grassfold, we're always improving our tools and we love to get feedback from our users. So if you've been watching this and you think you might have any suggestions for specific optimization features or indeed anything else, please let us know via the form which I've linked to in the description below. It would be great to hear from you. Thanks for watching.